Well, the title of my message today is, you know, what will we suffer? And it's in the form of a question is, what will we suffer according to the Bible? And, and I'm going to use the actual, both definitions that the word suffer is uh, used in the Bible. You know, suffer meaning uh, to feel or bear what is painful, disagreeable or distressing, either to the body or mind, or to endure, support, sustain, to not sink under, sink under our spiritual and strength in, uh, entire, to allow to permit, not forbid, uh, to undergo, to be affected by substances, suffer an entire change by the action of fire, by entering into new combinations. So basically, you know, and I'm not going to read the rest of them, the definition, it's, it's really two basic definitions. We're either suffering uh, because we have pain and it's causing us a pain or a burden or, or we have to carry something with us or we're suffering as we suffer something to happen. We allow it to happen. We permit it to happen. We, we, have, we allow it to undergo a certain, uh, a certain set of rules. So let's go there to Ecclesiastes 5 and Ecclesiastes 12, and this is where I'm basing uh, the sermon on, because it entails both of them. There in five, Ecclesiastes 5, verse 6 says, Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. In other words, don't allow thy mouth to cause your flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? In other words, it's interesting the way it's worded because... God saying, look, don't, don't allow yourself to sin in the flesh and then go turn around and say to the angel or to God or anybody, whoops, you know, I did it by accident, right? Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? And, you know, sometimes we play that game. And then the other, the other verse there is uh, verse 12 says, The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat a little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. And and right there, that word suffer, if you look at it the way it reads, is it's not allowing him to sleep, but he's also suffering because of the lack of sleep. So the sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. And what we see here is, uh, is the fact that we're going to cover what will we suffer? What, what are the things that we are going to allow in our life, in our Christian walk? And then what, what is God going to cause us to suffer in this life for the gifts that we're going to have eternally? I mean, obviously, number one is that we have eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. But, you know, you see here that God says there's a couple of things that are sweet. If it's the labor of a righteous man, right? The, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. And obviously, we know that God is referring to someone who's righteous because he's telling you don't sin. And don't pretend like you didn't sin, and don't cause it to err. So let's go ahead and uh, let's get into the message here. The, the first thing I want to focus on is uh, go, to, go to Matthew 8 while I'm setting up the point. Uh, go to Matthew 8, and then we're going to be in 2 Thessalonians. So go to Matthew 8, and then we're going to be in 2 Thessalonians. Uh, yes, 2 Thessalonians. And uh, the first thing we're going to notice is we're going to suffer eternally. Right, and there's two things that we're going to suffer. You know, either us as Christians, uh, we're going to suffer the temporal suffering that Christ has already set aside for us as walking the Christian life. And there's nothing wrong with suffering uh, what God has set aside for us. What uh, I think what's wrong is when we ourselves think that we need to cause suffering to our lives because we're walking the Christian walk. And this is the suffering or the temporal suffering. Because we have that eternal gift and we know what the eternal rewards are coming. Or the first point, it's the worldly point, right? Temporal indulgence for eternal suffering. So see, it's, double, uh, it's the double definition because you're suffering things uh, here on earth if you're walking for Christ. But you're also not allowing certain things in your life. But uh, you also have the, the individuals who have temporal indulgence. In other words... They, they're living for the world. They're indulging in the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. They're just taking on the sin of the world. And what they're doing is purposely, and eventually they, they get to the point where they're actively rejecting Christ and hating God. And then what happens is they're going to suffer eternally for all 
in, in all eternity in hell. So let's look here in uh, Matthew 8, and then uh, we'll make the point is Matthew 8, verse 18, and then we're going to go down to verse 31. It says, Now when Jesus saw, a great mul saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury the dead. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds of the sea, and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergensines, Ger there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fears, so that no man by, might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And there was a good way off from them, and heard of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And the reason I picked this set of, uh, of verses, because we're going to see three different instances where people are suffering for, dip, for the wrong reasons, right? And we see that uh, at the end there, well, at the beginning, you know, one of the things that I want to make uh, a point for, and, and I'm going to read this off of Jude 1, verse 7, it says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner given themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And then turn to 2 Thessalonians while we're there, but what happens is the world is reveling in the flesh, seeking instant gratification. So, you know, you see something about the comfort and the false importance that people give to their life. And, and we see those examples, right? Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities a lot, uh, about in like manner are now suffering the vengeance of uh, eternal fire. Why are they suffering that? Because what they did was they, they allowed certain things in their life, in the present life, you know, I wasn't, uh, I didn't, Pastor Cobb and myself, we don't call each other and discuss what he's going to preach in the mornings and what I'm going to preach in the afternoon, but it ties very well to the, the sermon that he talked about today in the morning about, you know, the opportunities past. And so what, what happens is the world gets so enticed with instant gratification that they think that's the opportunity that they're missing, that they need to go drinking or be the life of the party or fornicate or you know, and involve themselves in even more wicked sin, what ends up happening is they are going to suffer for all eternity. And so God's telling us, look, here's a couple of examples of some suffering because people either allowed it, the suffering of allowing things to happen in their life, or they're suffering things because, uh, you know, they're, because of the, of the life they're living. And we, if we go there to verse 21, it says, uh, of Matthew 8, He's talking, and you know the disciple wants to follow him. He says, and another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And he's a great example. You know, I've heard many descriptions. The way what I take the most out of this is that, you know, we tend to lose sight of what's more most important. And Jesus wants us to follow him no matter what. And it's not the fact that this guy wanted to go and bury his his father first, is that. He wanted to put priorities before God. I like to call it as a paralysis by analysis. What ends up happening is this guy wanted to get all his ducks in a row before he decided to follow Jesus. And Jesus is saying, look, what you're doing is you're allowing the world to take a hold of you and to give you certain customs and do certain things before you follow me when it's really the opposite. Jesus just says, follow me. If you look at uh, you know, the Gospels, well, he, he's, he does that multiple times when he's uh, recruiting the apostles. He says, look, follow me, come after me, and then that's what they do. There's no time for you to get everything in order. There's no time for you to put all the pieces into place. The only thing there is is today is the day of salvation. 
today's the day to allow yourself to follow Christ so that you can avoid the eternal suffering. Then we see here, uh, then the disciples that did follow him, now they're in the ship. So now, this is a good example of some of us, you know, that we've accepted Christ, we, we love Christ, but now we still have that tendency to want to go back to the world and the way the world does things. We want to put everything perfect and in order, and you see the waves are crashing. All of a sudden, the fear strikes. And instead of them knowing that they have Jesus Christ in the boat with them and that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and can control everything, he says, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. See, what happens is sometimes it's that temporal comfort. See, it's not a fun thing to be in something discomforting. And it's not a fun thing to get that instant fear, you know, that flight or fight response. And, and it happens, you know, God put that in our bodies so that we can uh, protect ourselves from doing something stupid. But there's times when we've trained that flight or fight response so much, it's so instinctive that we apply it to other areas in our life. I mean, this is one of those examples where, yes, they are in a dangerous situation. Yes, they're in a ship that's going to sink, but you've got to realize who's with you at that time. And sometimes, too many times, what happens is we get into the Christian walk and we start getting attacked and we start getting rebuked and we start getting the trials and the tribulations. And what ends up happening is we let that fear take over. And now we think the ship's going under when we've got to remember that Christ is with us because we're, we're, what we're focused on is the temporal, not the eternal. There's times where you just don't want to go to church or you're just too tired to make it to church or too tired to go soul winning or you've got too many things. But the main thing has got to be the main thing. Or if not, you're already suffering. For those who are saved, what we're doing is we're suffering less. We're allowing ourselves to lose some of the rewards. But for those that aren't saved, they're going to suffer that eternal vengeance, that eternal fire for all, all time. It never ends. That's, that's the definition of eternal. I mean, I know I'm being redundant, but there's no other way to describe eternity other than it's forever and ever and ever. And the challenge is that too many times we see people and they're living the temporal life and they're indulging in the things and we're afraid to speak up because we don't want to offend anybody or we don't want to you know, rub them the wrong way. And the reality is that we need to stop letting them know. We need to stop them from going into eternal damnation, from going into an eternal fire for all eternity. So let's go right there to the last part. And, and then this is how it ties that, that point together. Right there he says, And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergenses, Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs exceeding fears, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Here's a really good point. Even the devils know who Jesus is. Not only do they know that he's God Almighty walking in the flesh, man, but they know he's God Almighty, because here's the next part, and they know he's the Son of God, and it's not this created being, because if not, they wouldn't have feared him the way they do. It says, Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? They knew what was going to happen. As a matter of fact, they still do know what's going to happen. And here, here's the thing is you say, well, why even bring this point up? Because this is the influence of the devils. If the devils are looking for comfort because they know they're about to be tormented, but they don't want to be tormented before the time, what do you think they're planting in our minds with all these, uh, uh, with all these temptations and all these ways to go astray is to avoid the long, the long term uh, you know, torment. And, and, and society has become so complacent. It's so comfortable that we don't even know how to uh, suffer anymore. We don't know how to allow pain to push us and to drive us. I mean, Paul uh, asked Christ to remove the thorn at his side three times. And God said, you know, my, my grace is sufficient to thee. And that was it. And he, he plowed through it. Most of us would have given up after one. And then just called it a day, rolled over, and, and keeled, keeled over and died. And, and right here they say, you know, Art thou come hither to torment us before time? And there was a good way off from them and a herd of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, allow us. And I mean, I'm not, it says there, suffer. I'm just giving you the definition. Allow us to, us to go away in the herd of swine. Swine, suffer us. In other words, let us please you know, enjoy a little bit more of this comfort. It let us, uh, you know, possess a few more things 
before you come and torment us for what? They know what it's for, for all eternity. They don't have to say it explicitly. The Bible gives us very clear instruction that that is what's reserved for them. Hell is reserved for the devil and his angels. And now we, because of Adam's sin, we can now partake in it if we don't accept Jesus Christ. You know, let's go to 2 uh, Thessalonians uh, 1, 2 Thessalonians The book of 2 Thessalonians, and let's go to chapter 1. And it might be Timothy. I, I apologize for my abbreviations. I think it is 2 Timothy. No, no, it is 2 Thessalonians. I'm sorry. I use uh, ESORD for my verses, and uh, the abbreviation just threw me off, I, and I know better than that. But anyways, that's not the point. We all make mistakes. That's life. Uh, and that's why it's so important to stay in your word because, you know, sometimes the pastor and the preacher gets up and we're going to just, you know, get things backwards. If, you know, we just fix it and move on. But, uh, you know, th this is going to allow us to transition to that next point, which is the temporal, temporal suffering for eternal salvation. But if you look there in 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 5, it says, Which is manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer, seeing... It is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see a couple of things here. Those that are for Christ are suffering. That's verse 5, right? It says, which is manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer, which ye also bear, which ye also endure, seeing as the righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. See, what happens is those individuals that want to live you know, that indulging life. They want to live that uh, temporal indulgence. They want to sacrifice the eternal for the immediate. They're the ones that are troubling you. It doesn't start out that way, maybe. And most people probably don't think they're doing it. But the reality is that, you know, those few that are in power, they actually have a plan. You know, those that are tied to the devil and that, that serve in the highest uh, positions of the world, that are controlling certain things and are pushing agendas, that are telling us of this wickedness. Agendas, you know, where, where we call transgender people courageous. And agendas where we allow women to have a choice to murder little babies. These people, <coughs> they're troubling us. Now, those that follow, not all of them maybe uh, think of like that or, or agree 100%, but they just never been told that they need to stand on the Word of God. Because what happens is there's not enough leadership in America, there's not enough leadership in the world to remind us that we need to stand for Christ and that He's going to take care of the rest. It says they're seen as a righteous thing with God to recompense tribula tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, in, in, in obedience to Christ, we are going to suffer. The Bible tells us that, yea, then all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, right? It says, when ye shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day, wherefore also we pray for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. And then that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that's a great set of verses about just basically heaven and hell 
and you know what's gonna take transpire in the end time and who's gonna be on what side and if you notice there's no middle ground there but the world would have you think that there's middle ground to play with it's either because you believed and there was faith and the faith had power or you know they troubled you because they had the recompense of their tribulation so go there to Acts 5 go there to Acts 5 so the first thing is you know we're either gonna suffer eternally and it's a double definition right for those that are worldly they're allowing the indulgence of the world to cause that eternal suffering they're gonna suffer for all eternity in hell in the lake of fire which burneth with brimstone and fire right or you're gonna suffer eternally and I'm using that double definition again where you allow yourself to uh, you're gonna bear the pain and the anguish and, and the tribulations and the persecutions of living so that God allows you or suffers you to go into heaven you know temporal suffering for eternal salvation go there to Acts 5 Acts 5 and you know I'll turn with you guys here uh, Acts 5 and, and you know you never I know I said it earlier but you know it's worth saying again never sacrifice the eternal on the altar of the immediate and, and too often you know we, we'll put we'll put our comforts and what we think are our needs or really there are our wants over the needs of Christ and, and his calling you know I mean sometimes it's just too hot or it's too long or it's too difficult or it's too trying so we'd rather just go back to our comforts instead of doing the work for Christ there in Acts 5 go to verse 40 go to verse 40 of Acts 5 and we're gonna go to uh, verse 42 and it says and to him they they agreed and to him they agreed and when they had called the Apostles and beaten them they commanded they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go and they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name and daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ and if we were to read you know this is a whole other sermon we could do on its own if we were to read all of Acts 5 what we know is happening here is the Apostles were told not to preach the name of Jesus not to preach the gospel and then because they still did it and disobeyed man's law in this respect they were thrown in jail and then in jail they were like did we not tell you to do these things did we not tell you not to preach in the name of God did we not tell you to do this long story short when you get to the end of it they let them go and and to him they agreed and when they had called the Apostles and beaten them but they didn't let them just go first they beat them or they caused them to suffer pain they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go and what they do and they departed see they 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 refused to go back into the comfort it was much easier to listen to these guys and not preach the Word of God but instead what they did immediately was fight against that feeling and said and they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name see it's a it's a rejoicing it's a joy for us to suffer for his name it says in daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ that's where we get the heart for soul winning and you know uh, too often people just don't want to go out there and get the job done and when they do get the job done they uh, uh, or when you're getting the job done others see it and they poo poo the idea you know they'll say things like well soul winning you know doesn't work because people don't come to your church after you soul win well I mean the Bible is very specific that we're supposed to lead them to eternity now I'd love everybody to come to church but there's multiple reasons why people don't come to church you know they have friends and family who now are inviting them to church they, they've never been taught to, to go to church or they find a church closer to the area where you're so when you here in Houston within the five here in our area you know there's about I don't know four or five Baptist churches all within a two mile radius so if we door knock on somebody that, that's only like a block away from a Baptist church and they don't know any better, they might end up there. Or they might end up in, and that's not accounting all the mega churches and the contemporary churches and the watered down churches and the false doctrine churches. I mean, just in this area alone, there's probably like 20, 25 churches. That's just the way Houston's set up. And so for us, we should never sacrifice the eternal on the altar of the immediate, meaning, look, it was much easier for them after being beaten after being told what not to do to go back home and just stop doing it nobody would have nobody would have bad an eye nobody would have given them a, a hard time but instead they counted it worthy to suffer shame for his name you know now 
What's another thing that we will suffer? So us Christians, we are going to suffer persecution. We're going to suffer pain. And we also are going to suffer things in the sense that we're going to allow certain things to change our habits and our disciplines. You know, it's not an easy thing to will yourself to read the Bible every day when you first begin. And then even after you begin, there's always something trying to get in the way. It's, it's not an easy thing when you first get saved to pray every day or be uh, attending, you know, three times a week or go soul winning, you know, once, at least minimum once a week or twice a week. There's always something in the way, but you suffer to put away other things so that you can go and do the things of the Lord, right? So what do we, what we will suffer from our choices? You know, when you stand for nothing, you're going to fall for everything. And I know that's a popular saying, but it's a really good saying, you know, when you stand for nothing, you'll fall for everything. Unfortunately, I think the way they need to complete it here is the only thing we're standing for is Jesus Christ. You know, because people can stand for animals and they'll fight that plight all day long. People can stand for the poor, you know, and that, so they're not falling for other things. People can stand for false religions, but the reality is for us, the only thing we need to be telling people to stand for is Jesus Christ. And, and what's interesting is once you stand for Jesus Christ, you know, taking that stance stronger and, you know, really anchoring yourself in the Word of God, it's not that difficult. It's not that far-fetched to think that someone who's zealous for the Lord will just anchor themselves even to the point of death. But let's go there to 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter 5, and then we are going to be in 1 Timothy. 1 Peter 5, and then we're going to go down to 1 Timothy uh, 4. So 1 Peter 5, verse 7, the Bible tells us, Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your, in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish you, strengthen you, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him, glory, glo uh, let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinners appear? Whereof let, wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. And what's interesting is, you know, this set of verses comes after one of my favorite chapters, 1 Peter 4, where the Bible tells us that we need to rejoice, uh, you know, when we're reproached for His name. And we shouldn't think it's strange, uh, you know, when he gives us a fiery trial. And, what, and, and if you look at this, the reason that I picked this is because some, we need to make a choice. And it's not just, uh, and, you know, we're speaking to those that come to church. And we're going to, I'm making a blanket assumption. Even in a room of a congregation, it doesn't matter how big the room is, there's always the possibility that someone in there is not saved. Right? But... I'm going to make a blanket statement that if you're in church, you're saved, and you're listening to the Word of God, right? Well, God wants you to do much more than that. He wants you to suffer, and He wants you to change the things that you're doing. Now, change is not necessary for salvation. That's always so scary nowadays. You know, that, you, that, didn't, that really wasn't a problem even 15, 20 years ago, at least not when I was growing up. But now it is where people think that you have to, like, see white lights and have this, like, uh, cathartic, you know, very... Uh, hallelujah, trumpets are sounding experience when you get saved. I mean, for some people, it's a, it's a bigger experience. I mean, we've led people to the Lord where we're door knocking and, you know, they pray the, the sinner's prayer and then that's it. You shake their hands, you congratulate them, you give them a Bible if you have one and you move on. There's no tears, there's no lights, they just, they got saved, you know, and for all we know, they might go back to doing whatever they were doing, but they're saved forever. But here, the Bible's telling us it says in verse 10, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, it's just a little while. It's interesting, 
we look at life as long, 70, 80 years, but the older you get, the quicker life goes. And the Bible says it's just a little while, and then he says, make you perfect, establish you, strengthen, settle you. You know, the challenge is we have too many people sitting on the fence today. Too many people that have both toes in different waters. We have the, the lake of fire and we have the lake of eternity. And they're kind of trying to figure out which one they like best. And God says, look, you need to make a decision. And the only way you make that decision is once you've decided, guess what comes with that decision? Suffering. If you read First Peter, you know, I mean, that's constantly saying if you're reproached for his name, happy you are, you know, for the name of Christ. If, if he's going to send you fiery trials, he says, look, go out there and you're going to be happy when they're calling you names. You're going to be happy in your tribulations. You're going to be happy in all this. But then later on, he says, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 15 says, but let none of you suffer or allow yourselves to be a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a busybody in other man's matters. And guess what? When you allow these things to happen in your life, you're also going to suffer the consequences of that sin. So there's no point in doing that anymore. See, we're sinners saved by grace, but that doesn't give us a, uh, like a free pass to just go do whatever. You know, that's the biggest excuse people say. You know, if you're saved, can you murder someone and, go to uh, and you're still going to go to heaven? Well, yeah, you can, but God will remind you quickly that you're his son. He will chastise you and you will suffer those consequences. It says, in verse 16, yet if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. The Bible tells us that if we suffer, that if we allow ourselves to suffer as Christians, that if we change our life, if we change the way we talk, the way we dress, the way we, uh, the way we treat others, the way we think, the way we approach sin, the way we ask for forgiveness for sin, he says, let us not be ashamed. See, too many times... And, and, and you see that today, especially in the big contemporary churches, you know, just like the big Joel Olstein church across the, across the way here in Houston. You know, people are just living the life of sin. They're ashamed of Jesus Christ. They're ashamed of living a clean life for Christ because they don't want to offend or they don't want the peer pressure from their friends to tell them that, you know, they're weird, that they're no longer, uh, they're no longer cool. You know, what happened to you, man? I remember when I first got saved and, you know, I just decided to stop doing some of the things that my friends were doing. They're like, what happened to you, man? I think you're fake. Nobody just stops like that. Nobody stops doing those things. Well, no, I didn't stop just doing them. You just happen to be in the stage where I've already made that decision to stop. But it was a process over time. These are things that we've learned. But the Bible says, look, you, you know, when does it stop? Well, I mean, when does it start? When you're not ashamed, but you let him glorify God on his behalf. In other words, how do we glorify God on our behalf? When we're not ashamed of the gospel and we suffer, and we suffer as Christians. And then in verse 19 it says, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. And I love that faithful creator because we're, we're reminded constantly that it's God who created the world and that there is no such thing as we came from nothing. But let's go to the final point here, and uh, you know uh, we'll start wrapping this up. But ultimately, what should we suffer for our choices? You know, what is it that we're going to suffer for the choices? Well, and I'm talking about the Christian walk. You know, I could have done. A, I, I mean, we've already addressed a little here in the beginning, and, and we talked about the world. And I, I mean, there's plenty of verses on that. But I really just wanted to focus on what is it that us that are saved by grace? What is it that we're going to suffer? for making these choices, for constantly saying, okay, Lord, I'm not going to, I'm consciously not going to lust after the flesh, you know, and, and when I'm in that situation, I want to flee that sin, and I want to flee fornication like Joseph did, and I don't want to put myself in a situation where I even have to flee, or Lord, I don't want to put myself in a situation where I might be tempted to drink, or I might be tempted to, you know, accept the, the sodomites into our church, or be t uh, tempted to e even consider or, or just listen to false doctrine. What is it that we have to do? How are these choices made? Well, let's go to 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy 4, and we're going to go to verse number 6. 1 Timothy 4. <clears throat> 1 Timothy 4, verse number 6. And we're going to go down to verse 16. Timothy 4, 6 through 16. It says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse 
In other words, we make that conscious choice to say, no, thank you. Profane and old wives' ta fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that it now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, neglect not to the gift that neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this uh, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. And so we see. That it's a set of instructions of what we're going to suffer and the things that we're going to have, have happen for our choices. And we see there, it says, look, but refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Well, how do we exercise? It's a discipline. Because the next verse says, uh, for bodily exercise, profit a little. Well, I know a little bit about exercising. You know, when I was in college and I was young, you know, I spent many hours at the gym. And it's a discipline. You know, you get up and you force yourself and, you know, you did it for all the wrong reasons because you wanted big muzzles because you, you thought Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone were cool. I mean, that's really the fact. That's what I, you, that's why I worked out. I wanted these big muscles and I've always been a small guy and I thought it'd be great. And actually, at one point, I, you know, I, I got built and, and for nothing because the minute you stop working out, you get busy and life takes over. Guess what happens? The muscles start to degenerate within 24 to 48 hours. If you don't maintain that discipline, it, it, it's it's lost, but the Bible says there, exercise rather exercise thyself rather unto godliness. What's well, the same concept? We have to apply godliness into our life. We have to get up every morning and read our Bibles. We have to get up and pray. We have to get up and do these things. What does he say we have to do? He says, but godliness. So if you exercise thyself unto godliness, then we're going to see later in, four, in verse eight says, but godliness is profitable unto all things. So see when we're exercising the godliness though. It's always profitable to all things. It says, having a promise of the life that now is. So the God, God's given us some promises for now and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying worthy of all accept, acceptation. For therefore we labor and suffer reproach. And I like that, the way that's worded, because it's labor, meaning we work to go out and get some reproach. In other words, we actively seek reproach when we're preaching the word of God. See, when we go knock on doors, it's not always honky-dory. You know, a couple weeks ago, we went to uh, Hempstead, Texas with Pastor uh, uh, Jonathan Shelley. And man, that morning, uh, you know, I was out there soul waiting with Brother James, uh, one of the church members here. And we just, people, we got four or five kids, all under the age of 15, probably. And I mean, they just all accepted Christ in that morning. And then that afternoon, there was another, I mean, we just had a good day of soul waiting. But then last week or a couple weeks ago, we ran into a guy who was, uh, you know, work salvation. We had a couple of doors closed. We ran into like two Mormon uh, uh, young ladies that were out there trying to undo the work we were doing. I mean, we labored and we labored into like trouble. And so even though sometimes it's, it's real good and, and the reaping is great, the more work you do, the more trouble you're going to get into. I mean, we went out there, you know, and, and every once in a while we'll go out there and doors get shut on us and people tell us that, you know, that we're, that we're uh, supporters of Donald Trump. I mean, we've heard everything when we're out there soul winning. It says, for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach. So it's both. We labor and we allow the reproach. See, we don't have that young punk attitude that, you know, you pick a fight with somebody in order to hold your safe face and, you know, be all tough, you fight back. We have the attitude that people reproach us and we just take it. It says, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially those that believe. These things command and teach. And then he tells us to not despise, uh, let no man despise our youth. But says, be thou an example uh, of the believers in what? 
in word. So what we say out of our mouth, we need to be an example. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, that people are going to get saved because they see Jesus in me. You know, I, I hope they see Jesus in me, and I hope that I leave. A, but really what they're going to save is because they're going to call upon the name of the Lord, and we're going to preach the word. You know, because if they look at my life, I might on a, on a good day for, for a couple hours, I might do a good job, but I'm going to let you down somewhere along the line. You're going to see something, you're going to be like, that guy just messed up. That guy did something stupid. That guy create, committed some kind of sin. It might not be a big sin, but it's good. But, but the Bible says, look, he wants us to be an example regardless. But for, these, uh, for, uh, for this, for the labor and the suffering of approach, sorry, I got ahead of myself. It's just, what, are we, what are we an example in? We're an example in word, in conversation, in charity, or that love, right? That patient love in spirit. And then we're, we're, uh, we're an example in our faith. See, when things are going tough, you got to have that faith. you got to have that. Say, what did God say? Why did you fear? Oh, ye of little faith. We've got to have that faith. And when there's storms around us, we're going to continue because we know Jesus is with us, right? It says that impurity, that's the hard one because that means that we have to hold ourselves, be constantly be purging the iniquity in our lives, constantly be noticing what are the things that we're doing wrong. And not only that, you know, sometimes we point sin out in our life that we think is worthy sin. Like that we're like, oh man, I shouldn't be doing that. But there's us other sin that we might not be so aware of. And if a brother or sister in Christ calls you out on it, you better be quick to to review that before you take a wrong attitude for that. Because there's sometimes there's things that you can't see that others can see in you that we need to correct in our lives. Right? It says till I come give attendance to reading. That's how we, we're good in the word and conversation. To exhortation. That's how we love in the spirit and we have faith, right? And to doctrine. That's how we're strong in the spirit and faith and impurity. He says, neglect not the gift that is in, in thee, which was given to thee by prophecy with laying on the hands of the presbytery. He says, meditate on these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy prophecy may appear to all. In other words, not just a little bit, not just uh, sometimes, not just when you're at church on, Mon uh, on Sundays and Wednesdays or when you're reading your Bible and then you're out in the world. All the time. Holy means entire, completely, everything in you. Go to Job 1. Go to Job 1. And then uh, we're going to be in Isaiah. Go to Job 1, and then we're going to turn over to Isaiah. Go to Job 1, verse 6. So what are we going to suffer for our choices? Go to Job 1, verse 6. Job 1 is probably one of my favorite set of scriptures. Because when you finally read it in the context that it's in, without letting anybody kind of sway you one way or another, you realize there's a lot of power in living a godly life, but there's also a lot of challenges that come with it. You know, go to Job 1, verse 6, and we're going to go down to verse 12. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Has that now made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he had on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. So see, Satan knows that God's protecting him because he's a shrewd evil. It says, but put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord, you know when the Bible says that he's faithful to us? I mean, talk about the faith God had on Job. It says, and the Lord said unto Satan, and of course I'm, you know, I, I'm saying that from a, a, like a human point of view. Obviously God's faith is never wavering. It's just a, a good point to make. It says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath, hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And we know the rest of the story. You know, this is where he takes his children. He takes his cattle, his home. He, uh, you know, he attacks them with boils. And, and, and his wife and his friends turn on him. I mean, we know the entire story. But the couple of things that stand out is, the choices that Job made caused him to suffer on this earth temporarily, 
but he never gave it up because he knew what the eternal meant. You know, he, he was chosen, not Satan picked on him. God said, look, have you noticed Job? Satan hadn't taken a, a look at him, so it's not, Satan and his devils don't always notice everybody. Sometimes God's the one calling them out. Saying, have you noticed Job? You know, it, right, it, what, what did it say there in verse 8? And the Lord said unto Satan, has thou considered my servant Job that there is none like him in the earth? A perfect and upright man. Now, do is this talking about perfection like Jesus who walked the earth? No, it's talking about perfect like someone who's living for the Lord and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. In other words, Job was living for God because he took the you know he took the approach of First Timothy and he's living holy for the Lord. And now Satan says, well, now that you've called, now that you mention it, you know you did point Job out. I have noticed that you basically baby him. And that's why he's able to do the things that he does. But if you were to take it all away, in other words, if you take all his comforts away, if you just give him, if you take all that temporal, I guarantee you that he'll curse you. And now we know the rest of the story, and that wasn't the case. God said, look, go for it. And let's, let's see what happens. Because God knew that Job wouldn't do that. See, when you're holy, when your sights are set on the eternal, it's easy to overcome some of the temporal suffering. And I'm not saying that we should look for it. It's going to come. And I'm not saying that it's going to be easy because it's not. And I'm not saying that you're not going to have moments where you're just going to be like, what's going on? You know what God's saying? It says, look, if you endure it all, it, you're going to come out on top. Maybe not in this world. It says for the time now, uh, but also for the time which is to come. Let's go over to Isaiah. Go over to Isaiah 53. You know, why, why are we going to suffer for these choices? I mean, like... Does that even make any sense? Well, it makes perfect sense because Christ suffered first. He set the example. Though He says, if the world hates me or hated me, they're going to hate you, right? And Christ suffered. You know, in Isaiah 53, 10, this is the prophecy of Jesus. And we see there in verse 10, it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That's causing surf suffering. That's allowing pain on Jesus Christ in Isaiah 53, 10. And then we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 4. 1 Corinthians 4, but in Isaiah 10, he says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall see of the travail of his soul, it shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with a with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the, the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. In other words, this is talking about Christ, and we know this is talking about the sacrifice for sin, the plan of salvation. And what is it talking about? It's talking about it pleased the Lord to allow him to suffer this so that we could have eternal life. So what makes us think that we're going to escape if we're not even living a perfect life, we have sin in our life. We have things that we have to address. And then we want to live holy for God. If, if God says, look, my son who was perfect, Jesus Christ, will suffer certain things and he's perfect. Look, if you're living for me, there, it's just the logical step is you're going to suffer certain things. Go to 1 Corinthians 4 and then we're going to be in 1 Peter 4. So 1 Corinthians 4 and then 1 Peter. And then we're going to close out in... Uh, you might want to stay there in 1 Peter because we're going to close out in James and Peter. So 1 Corinthians 4, 1 Corinthians 4. You know, and, and the more you preach the word, I mean, we, we focus on certain words or we focus on certain stories and, and we need to preach it all. But you really look at it, it's really just one or the other that you, that you end up preaching a lot about because these are the things that we're having to deal with. You're either with the Lord or you're against the Lord. And here's the consequences for both. You know, so 1 Corinthians 4, uh, chapter, I mean, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 11, and then we're going to be in 1 Peter 4. So 1 Peter 4 and 1 Corinthians 4. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians 4 first. And it says there in 1 Corinthians 4, 11, and uh, we're going down to verse 13. It says, Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst, and are naked, and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place. In labor, working with our own hands, being reviled. We bless, being persecuted. We suffer it. 
Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as filth of the world and are the offscoring, offscoring of all things unto this day. And the Bible is telling us right there, look, you're going to labor and working with your hands and they're going to revile you. Because soul winning and working for the Lord is hard work and they're going to revile you. I mean, just this week, I had to re-register for an event I'm going to next week. Uh, it's called the Margin of Sign Conference. And because it's talking about this false religion of Judaism or the Jews that say they're Jews, but they're not. They're of the synagogue of Satan. Uh, they're reviling those people. The hard work that, that these individuals have put into it, these uh, companies have rejected them, have returned money with no question, have canceled things. You know, they're doing these things because it, it says, in laboring, working with our hands, they're being reviled. We bless being persecuted. We know of brothers and sisters that are persecuted. We suffer it. It says, being defamed or being talked about incorrectly, being uh, accused falsely, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world. The world thinks that we're filthy when we're calling out their filth. It says, and are the offscoring of things unto this day. In other words, we're the weird ones. We're the rejected ones. We're the ones who are causing uh, perversions and indoctrinations when in reality, we're just preaching the word of God. And then, and then if you go there to 1 Peter 4, 1 Peter 4, First Peter 4, verse 1 through 4, it says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he hath suffered in the flesh, hath ceased from sin. Then he long, no longer shall live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, when we have walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. In other words, when we give up the flesh, when we suffer for Christ, like he, when we take on the same mind as Christ, it says, for as much, let's break this down, for as much as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, it says, arm yourselves, or prepare yourselves, take on the weapons, take on this double-edged sword, likewise with the same mind, for he hath suffered in the flesh, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. In other words, when we're suffering in the flesh, it's causing us to, to stop that sinful nature in our life. It says that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. So in other words, now we're removing that that lust, that, that temptation. And it's, a, it's saying we're going to suffer because the flesh wants to do the things of the world. The flesh wants to just indulge itself in the pleasures that the world has to offer. And we're telling the, ourselves, no. We're going to arm ourselves with the same mind as Christ. It says, for the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. It says, when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wines, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, since where they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riots, speaking evil of you. In other words, when you decide to start changing your life for Christ, see, because it's not necessary. This is a conscious choice we make. See, salvation is by faith through Jesus Christ. We've made the choice to believe on the Lord and that there's nothing that can... Uh, Get us into heaven other than Jesus Christ. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. But once we start living that Christian life, we're making that choice to say, look, I'm no longer going to be in lasciviousness. I'm no longer going to partake in the lust and the excess of wine and the revelings and the banquet and abominable idolatries. Then all of a sudden, those that are around you will think it's strange that you're not running with them to that excess of riot. And they're like, hey, how come you're not coming out to party with us anymore? And how come you don't, uh, you know, partake when, when at the family gatherings when everybody's getting drunk and, and eating and watching football and all that? Why is it that you start removing yourselves? And why don't you let us uh, talk to your children? Or why don't we fellowship with you anymore like we used to? It's because we've decided to live for Christ and suffer in, a, in the temporal so we have that eternal reward. You know, and then the final point right here, go to James. And then we're going to be in 1 Peter, James 4. And then we're going to turn, so keep your thumb there in 1 Peter 3, 
but go to James 4. Go to James 4. Why do we do this? Because the, the reward is worth it all. You know, when we think about it, we think about what's going on, and uh, yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself here. And, uh, and the reward is worth it. I'll go to James 4, and then I'll keep my finger there in 1 Peter. That's what I was trying to do. Uh, James 4, verses 13 through 17. What does the Bible say when we, when, we, when we don't give up these things? It says, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year, a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, in your works. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. See, to do good is to avoid all of this. The Bible is telling us that, you know, when it talks about work, it's about feeding our families, it's doing the... the the things that we need to do to just take care of our families. It doesn't say go out there and plan all this so that you have this great wealth that you've amassed. Go to 1 Peter 3.8. The reason I'm, I'm pointing that out is because we're going to talk about the reward. Go to 1 Peter 3.8. 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 8. It says, finally, be ye all of one mind. Well, we already know what mind we need to take because we saw that in 1 Peter 4, the mind of Christ, right? Having compassion one another, love as brethren, be pitiful. Be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are there, ye are there unto called that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they may speak no guile. So it's possible to have to love life and see good days, but we have to do certain things: refrain from evil, uh, refrain the tongue from this, his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil, sounds familiar from Job, right? And do good, let him seek, seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? In other words, there's nothing that can harm you. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, Neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with a meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of, as of evildoers, that they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you, accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil doing, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And that's what I'm going to close out with. You know, we see that we're going to suffer. The Bible says, if it be the will of God, be so that ye suffer for well doing, than for evil doing. See, we're going to suffer either way. The Bible is very clear on that. It says, but it's better for you to suffer for well doing. Than for evil doing. It says for Christ, and that's the example we have, hath once suffered for sins, that uh, the unjust for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And so we see that we are either, we have a choice. We're either going to suffer for Christ, or we're going to suffer from our evil doing. And the reward is worth it all. It's not just the eternal reward, but God's telling us, look, it's possible that we could live a good life, and then we might not have to uh, suffer some of the things that others will, but there is going to be suffering. Not everybody's been called or uh, chosen to be killed. And not everybody's going to be beheaded. And not everybody's going to be persecuted the same way. But there will be persecution. There will be trials. There will be tribulations. But we have to consciously choose that when these things happen, we will allow them or we will suffer them to suffer our lives for Christ. You know, what will we suffer for Christ? We have to consciously make that choice every day. And we have to do it so that we can go out there and be fruitful for the Lord and do His will. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You so much for allowing us to just preach Your Word, Lord. And it is suffering sometimes. 
there's times when, when just the ministry is tough and, and it's not always uh, peaches and, and roses or whatever the saying is. But Lord, we know the reward and we know that when we look at it, the end thereof is better than the beginning. And we know that you have a plan for us and that, that at the end of the day, it doesn't matter even if we never see a good day here on this earth, which is, uh, which is possible. It just happens to some people that are living for Christ. But for the most part, we should be able to live a good and peaceable life. But if we didn't ever see a good day on, on this earth after believing on you, Lord, if we never saw another good day after we accepted you in our hearts, we know that we have an eternity with you where there will be no more pain and no more sorrow. So help us not only to know that that's a fact for us, but that we can also lead others to you, Lord, and that they may then uh, start to walk in that walk and, and purify themselves and in word and in purity and in, and in charity and in faith and in, uh, you know, in, in conversation, Lord, and all the things that you discussed in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.